Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 21st of June, the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, it's getting a bit scientifically embarrassing, the extent to which authorities are not talking about natural immunity. And in this video, we're going to talk about the equivalence between natural immunity and vaccination and indeed the, the possible uh, superiority of natural immunity. And this really needs to be taken into account. Now, I've just done some feedback for the Office for National Statistics. This is their feedback form. Include data on antibodies produced from natural immunity, uh, I have said. And <laughs> to be quite honest, uh, not, not for the first time. Now, most of what we're going to be looking at today comes from this paper here. And this is from the, uh, it's from the uh, British Medical Journal series, and it's basically to do with medical ethics. But it covers quite a wide range of topics, and um, we're going to be giving uh, as full evidence as we can as, as we go through about this topic. Now, COVID vaccine requirements debate. Well, I think it's fair to say there's been a debate, don't you? Um, Policies should have recognised proof of natural immunity, according to this paper, and I agree. It just doesn't seem to have been in the policies that natural immunity is important. A sufficient basis for exemption to vaccination requirements should be natural immunity, is a contention of this paper. But very often it's not. Um, now, the arguments here is there's two implausible claims about natural immunity. Now, first of all, this is a bit complicated, but natural immunity is superior to artificial immunity. It's not necessarily true. It's better to acquire immunity through natural infection. It may or may not be true. It's not true by definition. In other words, what we're saying here is just because something's natural doesn't mean to say it's better. I mean, snake venom's natural, but it's not a good idea to have too much of it. So to argue from simply the idea that it's natural is not accurate. We need, we need evidence as well as that. It's not a philosophical argument. It's a scientific argument. Uh, now, this is a naturalistic fallacy. Many things are natural, but not necessarily good. So saying that it's better naturally, by definition, is not necessarily true. Um, and a natural public health, a, nat uh, a natural public health strategy would have increased overall morbidity and mortality. So, if we had gone for natural immunity without the vaccinations, there would be more. There would have been more severe illness, and there would have been more deaths overall. Some individuals wouldn't have suffered vaccine side effects, but overall, the vaccines have reduced morbidity and mortality. But, but there's an unnaturalistic fallacy as well which means just because something unnaturally is going to be good. So vaccines are not necessarily better than natural because they are synthetic and man-made. So we can't really go from one philosophical argument or the other. We need actual evidence, which is what we're going to be uh, giving. Uh, so um, naturalistic fallacy, as we said, um, naturalistic fallacy. Uh, natural immunity must be better than uh, vaccine-induced. Again, not necessarily true. Neither of these are necessarily true. This paper says we lack clear and convincing scientific evidence that vaccine-induced immunity has a significantly higher protective effect than natural immunity. In other words, we can't say that the vaccine is better. It may well not be, and we're going to give evidence that it's probably not. Uh, can only be justified if, there are uh, if they are necessary for achieving a public health benefit. So vaccine mandates can only be necessary if there's a good, clear rationale without compelling evidence for the superiority of vaccine immunity. So if we're going to implement this strategy, this paper is saying from an ethical point of view, we should have compelling evidence. And basically the evidence is not there to show that vaccine immunity is significantly better than naturally induced immunity. It cannot be deemed necessary to uh, require vaccination for those with natural immunity. Now, we've been saying this for a long time. Good to see that the British Medical Journal is in uh, agreement. Full paper is there. Do, uh, do read it. We need to treat people on an individualised basis, not this one-size-fits-all basis. Why are governments going for this one-size-fits-all basis in their guidelines? The, the new guidelines from, from the uh, CDC, for example, on vaccinating children over six months of age, one, very, seems to me very much one-size-fits-all. Not the way I like to practice at all, at all, at all. Um, so rationale for uh, vaccine mandates, what would be the rationale? Preventing healthcare systems becoming overwhelmed. This was necessary in the past. 
Staff had to be vaccinated so they could go to work and patients had to be vaccinated to stop them becoming critically ill. This was true in the past. The other rationale was reduced community viral transmission. Now, the debate to which the, the level to which this is now true is mess up massively reduced compared to what it was. And if we look at the amount of transmission now as a result of Omicron, I think we can see that the vaccines are not preventing community viral transmission. So times have changed. I really don't believe I, I've changed. I've just changed with the times. So people are always saying, well, John says this now, he's saying that. Well, well no, the, the, the times have changed. The times have changed. Now, natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity evidence is what we now need. So the first paper I want to look at is from uh, here. This is the first paper we look at. Um, equi uh, equivalence of protection from natural immunity in COVID-19 recovered people versus fully vaccinated persons. And this is quite a large scale review. I'm just going to give you the outline of it. That there is equivalence, equivalence in this data. Um, all of the included studies found at least statistically equivalence between the protection of full vaccine and natural immunity. So same, same, that they are the, the same in this data. And three studies found superiority of natural immunity, as this study here looks at a lot of different uh, different cases, a pretty thorough uh, piece of work it is, in fact. Well worth looking at if you have an interest in this field. Now, the numbers needed to treat to prevent one annual case of infection in COVID-19 recovered patients is 218. So you'd have to vaccinate 218 people to prevent one case in recovered patients. In number needed to treat in COVID naive patients, 6.5. Now this is all the difference in the world. So now you would need to vaccinate 218 people who had had COVID. And again, we, we believe that the majority of the populations have in the UK and the US now. Well, we know they have. Um, whereas before, you needed to treat 6.5. Now, it seems to me that 6.5 would be a good idea. It seems to me that treating 218 to prevent one infection, not one death, one infection, is not a good idea. This is how this has changed. It was 6.5, treating 6.5 people to prevent one infection. Uh, if people are already exposed, it's treating 218 to prevent one infection. Times have radically changed. So that's a 33.5 fold difference between the two populations. So you could say there's 33.5 fold less reason to vaccinate now people in people who've been exposed. Our review demonstrate that natural immunity in COVID-19 um, recovered individuals is at least equivalent to protection afforded by vaccination of COVID-19 naive populations. So there you go. This is showing that... Um, Natural immunity uh, is at least, at least equivalent. Vaccinations recover people is of marginal benefit on an absolute basis. So if you look at the population as a whole, there's minimal benefit to this now. This has changed. The times have changed. Uh, for example, Omicron in adults aged 65 and over... Um, who've been vaccinated, minimal or no effect against mild disease with Omicron variants from 20 weeks after the second dose of the Oxford vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. So this is the category I'm in myself, in fact. Uh, minimal or no effect against uh, infection with Omicron. Um, infection, still protection against more severe disease, we believe, but not against infection. And of course, if I become infected, I can pass it on. So the idea that this is preventing viral transmission is a bit out of date. Uh, data are beginning to emerge which suggests that the effect of the vaccine on, tran uh, on transmission may diminish within a matter of months. Goes down quick. Now the next paper I want to take evidence from is uh, this one. And of course I always give the, uh, the full uh, links. This one's published in Science. Um, immunolo immunological memory to SARS coronavirus 2 for up to 8 months after infection. So again this is natural immunity. Immunological uh, memory is the basis for durable protection after injections or vaccines. So this is what we need to know about the memory, the immunological memory. Uh, sustained immunity memory is generated after COVID-19 infection and this involves memory B cells, antibodies, memory 
these CD4 plus T cells, th these are the T helper cells and these are the T killer cells. So um, it affects all of these, boosts all of these cells. Circulating antibody teeters were not predictive of T cell memory. Now, this is so important because, direct quote from the paper, so often, especially vaccine manufacturers, are talking about antibodies. That is not an indicator of the memory T cells, which is the long-lived response. I wish they'd move away from antibodies because in these sophisticated studies, they have the ability to look at the memory B and T cells. And um, it really is a bit surprising that, that they don't. Or they just seem to quote, quote the, uh, the antibodies more and more uh, all the time, rather than the, the thing that really is more important. And uh, so antibodies do not reflect the richness, I like that term, the richness and the durability of immunity to SARS coronavirus 2. So data from antibodies, is it irrelevant? No, it's pretty interesting. Does it confer long-lived immunity like the memory B cells and the T cells? No, it doesn't. We need the memory B cells and the T cells. Natural immunity just generate that, according to this uh, paper. Now, this is the third paper we want to look at. Reinfection rates amongst patients who previously tested positive for coronavirus uh, 19, COVID-19 disease. Again, references there. Now, this looked at 150,000 patients, 5.9% um, tested positive, 94.1% didn't. But they were able to work out that protection against reinfection was 81.8%. Uh, so pretty high levels of protection in people that had been previously exposed. Certainly comparable to the vaccination efficacy at the time. And protection against symptomatic infection was 84.5%. Now, of course, this has changed in Omicron times, but compared to how the vaccination efficacies were looking at the time, it is interesting to look at how favourable uh, the benefits of natural immunity uh, were and indeed are. Uh, this is the next paper here. Uh, the risk of SARS coronavirus 2 reinfection um, hosp and hospitalization with natural and hybrid immunity. Now, the main emphasis on this paper here, again, check out the link. Uh, this was from Sweden. Uh, cohort 1 had over 2 million people in it. Cohort 2, who'd had one dose of vaccine, getting on for a million people. And cohort 3, just over half a million people. So pretty impressive community-wide uh, numbers, likely to be highly valid data. 767 individuals with natural immunity needed to be vaccinated to prevent one infection. So again, further um, validation of the previous data that we'd looked at. You'd have to vaccinate 767 individuals with natural immunity to prevent one infection. One infection. And the people with natural immunity would already have high levels of fairly high levels of protection in most cases against severe illness and death. Now, you'll be pleased to hear this is the final paper we're going to look at, paper five. Again, just giving a, a spectrum of the evidence here, protection against the Omicron variant from previous SARS coronavirus to infection. And of course, we know that protection against the Omicron variant uh, is much uh, reduced in terms of uh, infection because of the immune escape that the Omicron variant shows immune escape against natural immunity and against vaccine-induced immunity. But um, this is the important point here. Uh, protection from prior infection against severe outcomes from Omicron remained robust. So 87.8% .8 protection against severe disease. So people who had infections with previous variants, whether it was Wuhan strain, alpha strain, delta strain, whatever it was, they were still having high degrees of protection against severe outcomes with Omicron infection. They were quite likely to still get reinfected, but they weren't likely to have a severe outcome. And again, we see comparable levels of data as good, usually as good as the vaccinations or better, because we know the vaccinations wane quickly. Reinfection often occurs with negligible symptoms so people often 
do get reinfected, but very, very minor symptoms. And high CT values. High CT values means they had to multiply the virus a lot to get it, meaning to get a positive result on um, the tests, meaning that they had very low viral loads. So previous infection, we can assume, is reducing viral load and reducing likelihood of getting severe disease, even in times of Omicron, which is good news for natural immunity. So the case for natural immunity exemptions, going back to this original paper uh, that we looked at from the British Medical Journal, um, vaccine requirements have significant costs. Financial costs are high, as we've looked at. Very high financial costs. There's a lot of profit being made in a lot of big pharmaceutical industries at the moment. Um, and uh, I must say I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the profit margins being made by some pharmaceutical companies at the moment. Uh, substantial infringement of uh, individual liberty by having vaccine mandates for those that are already infected. I would agree with that. And there are non-trivial risks associated with vaccination. So there are risks associated with vaccination and they are not trivial. Direct quotes from that paper. So why, why is it that national agencies are not taking into account natural immunity? It's almost as if they're trying to pu push out as many vaccines as possible. Now, that was good in the past. Now the risk-benefit analysis has changed. So why are they doing this? Is it still this simplistic idea that we better not share any nuance with the public that we better just say everyone gets vaccinated and that's the end of it so all, all the plebs go oh we need to get vaccinated and that's the end of it let's trot off and get vaccinated is that is that what they're saying if so that's insulting or, or is it something more than that, that that we're not being made aware of i'll leave that one with with you the uh, final one I want to look at is uh, this. Uh, the biopharmaceutical industry provides 75% of the FDA's uh, drug review budget. Is this a problem with a question mark? Now, this is from Forbes. Now, the, Forbes have kindly made this uh, public uh, domain. So I'll leave you uh, to read that for yourself. Um, but it does seem at least in the American system, at least, and many problems with the UK system as well, of course, but with the American system, it does seem that it's the end users that are largely paying the bill for the uh, Food and Drug Administration, and they control, and it, I think it tells you here, so it's, it's huge, but basically huge amounts of the, um, the food and vaccine and pharmaceutical industry in the States. And yet um, this Forbes article saying the biopharmaceutical industry provides 75% of the FDA's budget. Is this a problem? So what I've tried to do, and again, this is outside my field, I'm not an accountant. But what I've tried to do in, in this video is give scientific evidence rather than um, one size fits all evidence. And I've tried to give an objective scientific opinion rather than a, a financial opinion. So if you got to the end of this video, I know it's been complicated, but uh, thank you for watching.